Okay, guys. Hey, this is uh, G for T uh, with Survive and Thrive TV. We're here with uh, Doctor X. He's um, a doctor in the Veterans Administration, very uh, high up, and um, has intel with regards to the uh, the gun grab that's happening with the veterans and uh, active uh, duty military. We've reported on this continuously at the channel. I also have. Um, um, a co-worker of mine, too, that might be in on the conversation, and her name is CJ. And we are going to ask this doctor a series of questions. Now, his voice is going to be changed, guys, so we have to protect his identity uh, because it's very dangerous with the information that's being coming out. But he's compelled by his conscience to let us know exactly what is happening in this country with gun confiscation with veterans and beyond. So could you give us an idea a little bit? Uh, tell us about yourself in the sensibility of a little bit of your background. And if this could be any doctor in any of the Veterans Administration hospitals. Could you just tell us a little bit about a typical doctor in, that, in, that, in, a, in a hospital type environment situation? Sure. The VA and, and, and private hospitals are a little bit different in as much as the Veterans Administration falls under, obviously, the, the government umbrella, whereas private hospitals fall under, you know, private insurance. I'm a psychiatrist from a VA hospital as well as a, a psychiatrist in a local hospital. And what is causing you to come forward with uh, this information? What is happening right now? Well, over the, the last several years, uh, myself and a couple of colleagues have noticed that um, things have just been getting a little bit um, uneasy, so to speak, with our veterans. Any veteran who's been who's a listener who is in the VA system who has spoken at least to a psychiatrist because our questions are a lot more intrusive than your average question um, will probably be able to, to relate to what I'm about to say how our questions will, will, will ask things about their family life, where they grew up, how many members of the family, if there's any abuse, things like that. And um, uh, the questions over the last five years have just been getting a lot more intrusive. Um, they ask about schooling, you know, um, whether or not you own firearms, um, whether or not, you know, you have any anger towards people around you, which is an, an odd question for anybody to ask. Um, and it would it just seem that the hospital that I'm at, most physicians, um, and I say most, not all, there are going to be some who's going to hear this who's going to say, that's not me, I totally disagree, and, and I'm saying most physicians uh tend to sort of either be indifferent or hostile towards the veterans in, in as much as in their private lives, when, when the, the door shut and the patient's out of the room, so to speak. Um, most, almost all Veterans Administration hostels, the main hostels, are associated with a residency program or a medical school, and there will be residents and medical students there, and most of those hospitals recruit right from that residency pool and in the case say in New York they're associated with Albert Einstein and NYU, you know, it's a very, very, very liberal university and their views are very, very liberal and the veterans are seen as the enemy. You know, they're seen as baby killers and you know just it's just not what most veterans would probably think it is. Can you tell us why you are coming out and um, giving us this information? I've, I've tried to come out before with this. Um, I have a lot of friends and family members who are veterans who go to VA hospitals, different VA hospitals for help. A lot of my patients that come to me, I mean, I, I took an old for to, to protect my patients, not to, to be a government worker, um, and not to not to not to do this. Um, as I said, I've I've tried to to get this information out before, but it had always fallen on deaf ears. And I think that the reason is that when this 
Navy veteran who came out and it, it you know, people were actually shocked that this is happening. My question wasn't, wow, you know, I can't believe this is happening. My question is, I can't believe that it, it took this long for this to come out, you know, because this has been going on for some time now. I think the interest in it now is, is, is now there's an audience for it. When I first tried to, to say this two years ago, and, and I've tried to get in touch with many, many, many different news outlets and different people. I've tried for a long time to do this, and it just fell on deaf ears. I think with with this Navy vet who came out and, and all this happened, I, I guarantee I can I can see exactly what happened when when there's there's no question in my mind that it happened to him. My question was, I can't believe it's taken this long. So I, I figured, well, maybe I'll try it again and, you know, see if I can get this information out there. I, I'm doing this strictly because, as I said, I have friends and family who are veterans. I have I have family members that I tell them not to do this. You know, there are a lot of us out there. And I think once once the ball gets rolling, I, I, know, I know for a fact there are a lot of physicians who are against this. There are a lot of physicians who are against this, who do not like this happening, but they don't want to say anything because, you know, if, if they get found out, they lose their career. You know, we go to school for a very long time, go to residency for a very long time to, to get what we have, you know, and, and what else What else would they do? They're, they're afraid. A lot of people are afraid. But... And as I said, this isn't the first time I've tried to get this out. I've, I've, I've tried, I mean, in all honesty, and in, in all, you know, to get all the cards on the table, I've tried to get this out to many, many different outlets. But now I just have the audience. Okay, Dr. X, what is um, happening right now with gun confiscation? What exactly is the doctor's role, and how is the Vet Veterans Administration being used or implemented in this uh, nationwide gun confiscation of uh, veterans. I've I've tried to come out before with this. Um, I have a lot of friends and family members who are veterans who go to the VA hospitals, different VA hospitals for help. A lot of my patients that come to me, I mean, I I took an oath for to to protect my patients, not to to be a government worker. Um, and not to not to not to do this. Um, as I said, I've I've tried to to get this information out before, but it had always fallen on deaf ears. And I think that the reason is that when this Navy veteran who came out and it, it you know people were actually shocked that this is happening. My question wasn't. Wow, you know, I can't believe this is happening. My question is, I can't believe that it, it took this long for this to come out, you know, because this has been going on for some time now. I think the interest in it now is, is, is now there's an audience for it. When I first tried to, to say this two years ago, and, and I've tried to get in touch with many, many, many different news outlets and different people, I've tried for a long time to do this, and, it just fell on deaf ears. I think with with this Navy vet who came out and, and all this happened, I, I guarantee I can I can see exactly what happened when when there's there's no question in my mind that it happened to him. My question was, I can't believe it's taken this long. So I, I figured, well, maybe I'll try it again and you know see if I can get this information out there. I, I'm doing this strictly because, as I said, I have friends and family who are veterans. I have I have family members that I tell them not to do this. You know, there are a lot of us out there, and I think once once the ball gets rolling, I I know, I know for a fact there are a lot of physicians who are against this. There are a lot of physicians who are against this who do not like this happening, but they don't want to say anything because you know if. If they get found out, they lose their career. You know, we go to school for a very long time, go to residency for a very long time to, to get what we have, you know, and, and what else what else would they do? They're, they're afraid. A lot of people are afraid. But as I said, this isn't the first time I've tried to get this out. 
I've, I've, I've tried, I mean, in all honesty, and in, in all, you know, to get all the cards on the table, I've tried to get this out to many, many different outlets, but now I just have the audience. So it looks like um, the government's after the guns, and they're starting with the veterans. Which agency do you think is uh, pushing the hardest for the doctors to come after the guns? Is it DHS? Is it some other organization? Where do you feel the pressure is coming the most for the doctors to take away the guns, and could you just comment on that? Right now, what I know, I can comment on what I know. I know the VA is what's doing it right now. Um, whether or not Homeland Security is behind it, I don't know. I do know this, that the game plan is to get to get what whatever whoever is going to be, whatever help in human service is going to be called, because I'm, I'm I'm sure they're going to change that into something else. But whatever the Department of Health and Human Service is going to be called, that's what I think is going to be pushing the civilian gun grab when it happens. But right now, I know it's the VA. I don't know if the FBI or DHS. I don't know who's behind it. You know, for a fact, I can only speculate. My speculation would be uh, Homeland Security. So veterans that have records, and it sounds like uh, their records are open to Homeland Security as well as other agencies very easily, they're being held hostage to that participation in the Veterans Administration for this gun grab. Could you talk about the mechanisms of what you guys are using to go ahead and get them to surrender their weapons or to actually seize them? Sure, we don't actually seize the weapons ourselves because the last thing a physician wants to do is put themselves in a, a, a dangerous situation. What we'll do is, um, say a patient comes in, and again, a lot of veterans, are, I am absolutely certain because I'm sitting on the other side of the fence, a lot of veterans will, will understand this. They'll come in to see me for a follow-up exam, all right, after... What happens when a veteran first comes in, when they first come into the system, they'll sit with me for an hour. And I'll have an hour to sit and talk with them, and I'll collect as much information as I can. I'll collect all the family history, school history, the military history. You know, I'll go through depression screenings, bipolar screenings, psychosis, everything. I'll just go, that's why I'll have an hour to sit with the veteran, you know. And it usually takes about an hour to go through everything. And then if I, you know, odds are I'm going to prescribe a medication. Prescribe a medication, the patient comes back after a month to three months. Usually when the patient's stable, they will see him every three months. So now if the patient's been in the system, say they came in in 2009, and they've been stable on their medications. They come in every three months, and I just make sure that they're doing good, ask if there's any side effects, everything's fine, okay, we'll mail you prescriptions, whatever. Now what we're doing is we'll say, um, I see on this progress note that you own firearms. Is that correct? And the patient will say yes, or the patient will say no. The patient says yes. I will say to them, I have to ask you to surrender those firearms. The patient always says no. They're like, no way. What I will do is I will have the VA police come to the room. We have, there's a little button there called panic buttons that are under every desk. And, and the patients can see wherever their psychiatrist is sitting. There's always going to be a button, great right where a drawer should be. But at that button, the police come. They already know now exactly what's going to happen. And we'll say, okay, you're going to surrender your firearms and we're going we're gonna to involuntarily hospitalize you. Again, different states to call different things. And by the time the VA police get there, I'll explain, hey, listen, you know, you're going to be hospitalized. You're not going to be going to work today or tomorrow or the day after the day after that. You know, this is just, this isn't from me. This is coming from above me. You know, this is just how the game is being played now. We could do this the, the easy way or we could do this the hard way. And if it's the hard way, it's just not going to end well for you. And it usually ends up the hard way. 
you know, they're, they're like, no way, I'm not giving you my guns. You know, this is this is an outrage, and it is. It's an outrage, which is why I'm coming forward. But um, what the VA police will do is they'll sit down, they'll, they'll take them out of the room, so I won't have anything to do with it. I'll just initiate the, the involuntary hospitalization order, and I'll fill in why, and I'll sign my name and stamp it and everything else, and they will go to the psychiatric ward or they will leave with the VA police. If they leave with the VA police, then they've already surrendered the rest of weapons to the VA police or whoever. You know, I mean, I don't know if the VA cops call the local cops. I, that, I have no idea. I don't see that. Usually what I'll do is I'll, I can see who's down in the, the psychiatric ward right from the computer and I'll see who's being admitted down there and well, I'll call them and say, you know, so and so is going to be coming down. We're we're involuntarily hospitalized, and, and uh, that'll be the end of that. And then again, it's just wait and smoke them out. It's called. Um, we again, we know, we know for a fact that that you're going to have to go to work tomorrow. That you know, your kids are going to be saying, "Where's daddy? Where's mommy?" You know. And uh, the other option is if the patient doesn't want to answer. Because, again, the patient knows that if they get caught lying to anybody in the VA hospital, they can lose their benefits. Nobody wants to lose their benefits. So what we will do is we have a, a, a window that, that says, you know, there's patient and firearms, yes, no, or no answer. If we click no answer, it defaults to yes. So we go through the whole rigmarole, you know, the, we got to get your guns, blah, blah, blah. If they answer no, then they answer no. Then I say, okay, you know, how how are your medications? Any side effects? Feel suicidal? Feel homicidal? Nope. Have a nice day. We'll mail you your meds and off to the next patient. And is this a personal payment to the doctor or is this part of your budget? No, what it is, um, we get... The way the, the way the VA works, um, as far as paying their physicians, is we get a base salary and then we get bonuses, and we get bonuses for doing the most, I mean, the most ridiculous things that you can possibly imagine. I mean, I get a nice huge bonus that could buy a car if I sit in on a resident and watch a resident do. An examination. If I watch a resident do his or her job, I, I get a huge financial incentive for that. So we really get more we get more pay in our bonuses than we do our base pay. And this um if for example, I mean three thousand dollars per veteran, if I if I get five veterans to surrender their guns voluntarily or involuntarily that's fifteen thousand dollars. Now I see ten patients a day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so this is the. Then this is just me. I work in a, a, a large VA hospital where there's twenty eight psychiatrists. So this is this isn't just my hospital. This is this is everywhere, and and you've got to understand. Again, the mentality of the, the psychiatrist and the mentality of a lot of the physicians is these people don't deserve to have weapons. These people are dangerous. These people are, are the word now is white supremacist. These people are white supremacists or separatists. I'm sorry. That's, that's the word we've been told to put in the progress notes. White separatists. If, if you live in a, a neighborhood where there's no black people, or if there's no Hispanic people, or if there's no Muslim people, you're considered a white separatist. And these people are white separatists. God forbid they have guns. You know, they could go crazy. They could go on a shooting spree, you know. Now, if I'm a veteran and I come in and I say that I think Obama is hurting the country, I believe in the Constitution, I believe in the rule of law, and I say things along those lines. I, you know, I disagree with the wars. I disagree with the police state that's happening in this country. Now, could those be used to confiscate my weapon? That is an excellent question, and the answer is yes. 
and here is why. A lot of the questions that, that I'll ask you on your initial evaluation or even, even later on if you come in for a follow-up is, do you feel that the government is, can, or do you feel that the government can watch you, C-A-N? Now, yes, everybody does. The government can watch you whenever they want. Well, that, that, that leads you into the paranoid area. Do you believe that the government wants to take your guns? Well, I think it's abundantly clear, whether you're on the left or the right, that they do want to take our guns. That would put you in the paranoid area. If you talk about the war, if you talk about anything that, that doesn't go along with the Obama agenda, yes, you are put into a category without any question as possibly dangerous, and you definitely should not have a gun, and we definitely got to put you on medications. Absolutely. If you say that you, if you say that you agree with Obama and everything else, and this is this is new. I mean, I've I've been doing this for, for a lot of years, and and this is new. You know, in the last five years, patients. They never came in and talked about politics. I, I never really cared. Now, now, I, I can't see one patient without them bringing up some politics or, or anything like that. And that's definitely put in the progress note, without any question, that anybody on that list that all veterans have, have access to. Now, if I'm a veteran and I come in and I tell you that um, I'm a truther or I'm a patriot, <clears throat> I look at the InfoWars website, I listen to Alex Jones, just by saying that, is that enough to uh, instigate uh, gun confiscation? That's not per se. I mean, if we're going to ask about the guns regardless. If you say that, if you come in and you say you're a patriot and you have a Gadsden flag and... You know, you listen to Alex Jones or whatever. The personality of the, the psychiatrist or the physician is such that they're going to categorize you in a progress note. You have subjective, you have objective, you have what, what we what we see, what you say, and, and in that subjective part, we're going to put down. You know, patient states that he's a, a you know in a patriot movement. A patient states this, you know, he listens to conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones, absolutely, and that's worded like that. Now, the importance of this is a lot of, pe a lot of people out there might say, well, well, that, you know, big deal. I, I, I saw a psychiatrist one time, and, you know, now I go to get, you know, root canal done, or well, and you really don't get much dental there, but, you know, I get my blood pressure medication or whatever. Well, in in the computerized system, what happens is is your internal medicine doc will bring up the psychiatry note, and they'll see in there, you know, patient listens to conspiracy theorists, quote unquote, like Alex Jones. Patient has a Gadsden's T-shirt on. You know, patient is acting, you know, a little bit hostile. You know. Because that's that's going to be the, the the doctor's view of you. You know, their their opinion matters. A physician's opinion in your progress matters. You know, it makes a difference. So absolutely, if somebody came to me and they said that they listened to Alex Jones, I wouldn't put that in a progress note because I really don't care. That has nothing to do with with your health. But I'm I'm one of those people who's starting to see the, the evil that's going on in, in healthcare, especially towards vets. What type of veterans do you feel are, are most likely to be unfairly targeted for gun confiscation? For example, could you go over a couple uh, profiles of uh, veterans that you've met, the type of person Absolutely. that unwittingly would be targeted? Could you uh, describe in detail that type of person? White male. Okay, so what you're saying is if you're white and you're male, and I would assume conservative, 
be very, very careful of what you say to your doctor, or if you're going to see your veteran administrative doctor already, you can pretty much uh, guarantee that there's going to be some sort of, sort of psych evaluation. Well, right now we're at that point where, you know, a, a lot of people might think, well, the damage is already done. I, I, I unfortunately um, hear this a lot, you know, um, on the outside, that the, the damage is already done. Um, I have family members who are veterans. I have friends who are veterans, and this is why I'm coming out. And they, they always say to me, you know, well, well, the damage is already done. I already told them that I have firearms. Now, that, that's a yes and no answer. Yes, you know, I would say my advice is always from now on be careful what you say and be in control of what you say. Be very, very careful of what you say because your words count. And be very careful of what you say. I am. I would never tell anybody to lie to their physician, as I would not lie to a patient. But I will tell you this: if I was a veteran and I had to see a psychiatrist, and I'm telling you this as a psychiatrist in the VA, I would not go to see a psychiatrist in the VA. I would not go to see a doctor in the VA. If I didn't have the money, I would think of something else. And as unfortunate as that sounds, I would I would not have a family member of mine. And I, I've done this with my family members. They will not go see a VA psychiatrist, period, end of story. That's that. Okay. Well, that was answering my next question, which was, how can you absolutely avoid having your guns taken away? And what you're basically saying is to avoid the system altogether. Don't go to the VA as far as a psychiatric unit. Don't mention anything that you support the Second Amendment or that you're part of Oath Keepers or you're a patriot or any type of political views with your regular normal doctor as well as, well, you don't even want to see the psych psychiatric doctor, correct? Now, let me, let me just, just be clear because there are a lot of people who right now are on psychiatric medications. There are a lot of people that actually need those psychiatric medications. What I'm saying is, if you can find somebody else to go get those medications from, then if you have that option, then absolutely go see somebody else. What I am saying is, I'm not telling anybody to avoid any kind of psychiatrist, believe me, because I, if there's one thing I can tell you, you know, people who need psych meds need psych meds. What I am saying is you're at a point now, we are at a point now in time, unfortunately, in America, where if you want your medication, you're not having a gun. Okay, I understand that. And we've talked to uh, veterans as well as active duty members there seems to be some type of tie-in with benefits packages and then how far the government's going to go to take your guns. I mean, we talked with one uh, gentleman that had a, a post-traumatic distress, and he, uh, he said there's a whole bunch of benefits that when you try to access them, that, that uh, notifies somebody in the system, and that's when they try to go after your guns. Can you name a couple for us? What are some of the things that would, that would typically alert the, the system to uh, go after your guns? Well, sure. First of all, let me say this about post-traumatic stress disorder and the VA. And again, I, I, I would really ask your listeners to look up every single thing that I'm saying, number one, but especially this. In 2010 or 2011, the Veterans Administration decided that in order for a, a, a patient, in order for a veteran to collect PTSD benefits to be, you know, classified as, as a percentage of disability for PTSD, they lowered the standards, which means that you used to have to be in combat to get a, a, a PTSD disability. That's no longer the case. You could be stateside 
be in a car accident, be in a DUI car accident, develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which, which people do, and still claim benefits for it. And again, this changed in, I believe it was 2011 this changed. And people, we just started getting flooded with, with patients coming in because now, you know, I mean, you get 80%, you know, 100% of what you were getting when you left. A lot of people can't find work, so they come in and they get that disability benefit and, you know, it's great for them. You know, they get a check every single month and they get medications, they get sleep medication. Everybody wants a sleep medication. They get the sleep medications, they get, you know, maybe something to make them feel a little better. And that's why there's a, a big backlog with, you know, the VA benefits right now. It's not because of people sitting around doing nothing on our end. It's because two years ago, we lowered the standard for PTSD and for all these other um, psychiatric disorders so that anybody could come in. You know, you didn't have to be out in combat and fighting and, and seeing all that, that, that horrible, horrible stuff and then come back and, and claim benefits. Now, you know, I mean, people, there, there's a guy, I have a patient who has 80% benefits who tripped on an escalator in a mall. And he's collecting 80% PTSD because when he tripped him on the escalator, he thought he was going to die. And, you know, if for PTSD and for any of the other psychiatric diagnoses, PTSD, um, if you have flashbacks, of, if there has to be an event that causes a significant disturbance that had to have happened it had to have taken place at least six months ago. If it happened within six months, it's not considered PTSD, it's considered something else. But there has to be a significant event. You have to have a, you have to fit in a certain criteria. You have to have a flashback. You have to have nightmares. You have to have a sleep disturbance. Things like that. Um, for as far as the criteria for taking your gun, if you've seen a psychiatrist, you're getting your gun taken. And the, the thing that initiated this, I've been trying to say this and get this out for quite some time now. When I heard the, the, the veteran, the Navy veteran, who, you know, went in because he had some back pain and his, his, his doctor said, well, I want you to see a psychiatrist. He said, no. When I heard that, and people were surprised about it, your listeners were, were surprised about it, I was more surprised that it took this long to come out. Because that's normal. If you go in for, for, say, stomach pain, odds are you're, you're going to see a psychiatrist because that doctor doesn't want to have the responsibility of giving you a pain medication. So they're going to pass it on to a psychiatrist. And if you see a psychiatrist, that's what I'm going to ask you. Do you have a gun? And if you say yes, guess what? You came in for some stomach problem. You came in for, for you know, acute diarrhea. You're now... You're now in the, the psychiatric ward until we get your guns. And a lot of people have been saying, you know, for, for the last few years, they've been saying, you know, I own this, you know, diet patients who say, you know, I own this, I own this. They, they're crystal clear with how many firearms they own. And it's on record now, you know. This isn't something that, that is, is brand new. This has been going on for some time. It's just ramped up quite a bit in the last couple of months. Since January, it's just it's just really, 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 really ramped up. Can you talk about uh, registered gun owners and um, how they might be in danger? Um, it, is the, it sounds like the Department of Homeland Security has some sort of list, and they're they're providing that information to you guys or are you relying primarily on self-reporting here with finding out who has the registered guns? What was you, What's your uh, take on that? We're relying solely on self-reporting. We don't get any information from Homeland Security or, or we don't get information from the VA police or anything like that. It's, it's entirely self-reporting. 
could you talk about uh, very briefly the mechanics involved in actually taking your guns? What is the process involved? And I know you don't go with the police to the house, but could you tell us, you know, everything that you know with the mechanics, the specific details on how they get you the gun? Well, I, I know what I've, I've told you as far as initiating the, the psychiatric, involuntary psychiatric hospitalization. If you come in, do you have a gun? Yes. Why well, do you do surrender it? If you say no, I hit a button. I hit what's called the panic button. The VA police come in. As I've explained all that, that's, that's as far as I know with that. I will say this. I will add this that happened to the, the Navy veteran who, who called you. Here's something that that's, uh, we've been doing for a while, but for some reason, again, it's just, it's taken an evil, evil turn lately. If you miss an appointment, then we were required by the VA, by our, by, you know, our, our policy is if you miss an appointment in psychiatry, we have to call you to find out why you missed that appointment. Most people, they just don't want to come in. You know, they don't want to sit around for four hours in a waiting room. You know, they, they just don't want to come in. Um, some people forget whatever the case may be. If you call, if I call and you're, you sound intoxicated or if, you know, you're flagged, so to speak, you know, if you own firearms and you came in with the gas in and, you know, all that other good stuff, I'll call the VA police to call the local police or the local sheriffs to do a wellness check. Now, what happened to that Navy vet? It's very, very, very common. And police do wellness checks all the time. There's nothing nefarious about that. Police like to do wellness checks because they're either going to, you know, if they knock on a door and somebody's in distress, they get to help them out, and that makes them feel good. You know, they're not really dealing with the guy shooting at them. However, lately, the VA police will ask us, where they will look themselves in the computer system to, you know, do they own guns? And we'll say yes. You know, they'll say, well, how many or, you know, do you know? We'll say we have no idea or this is what they are. They'll pass that information on to the local police. What the local police does when they get there, in, in that one veteran's case, was obvious. They went in, as, as police officers do, do you have any firearms here? Yes. Well, you know, why is it that, you know, you didn't want to see a psychiatrist? If, if, if the doctor says, I want you to see psychiatry, and a patient just says no, you're a hostile patient. And if you run, the police are going to come. You're going to get a knock on the door, you know, because you're, you're, you're hiding something. I tried to, to, to say this earlier to the other people, if, if this happens to them, and again, I, I know I'm getting off the, 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 the topic here, but if, if you're asked, if you go in and you have a headache and, and your physician says, I want you to see a psychiatrist, my recommendation is to say, I, I will see a psychiatrist. I want to see my own psychiatrist. I will do the research myself. I will find my own psychiatrist. I appreciate the offer. You know, be nice about it. I appreciate the offer. Say something like, you know, my my neighbor down the street is a psychiatrist. Let me talk to him or her. This way you're not coming across as being a hostile patient and you're taking a doc's advice. If they're adamant about it, I would say, you know, I have to go to the bathroom and just make a beeline for the door. But as far as, you know, getting back to the mechanics of it, all I know is what I know is, and that's how we initiate the involuntary hospitalization. And every state is different. In New York, it's called a 2PC, 2-physician consent. In Illinois, it's going to be something different. In California, it's something different. Every state is different, but they all have it. Do you have an idea of what states are going to be rolling out 
the hardest and the fastest with taking uh, veterans' guns. We've been getting stories from Connecticut and, of course, California. Um, do you have any idea from your perspective which areas are going to be, uh, you know, the hardest right now? Sure. It's not the state because the VA is, is federal. It's going to be the university that the VA is associated. It's all going to happen. I mean, this is all going to happen. It's going to go VA-wide, and then it's going to go nationwide through the Affordable Health Care Act. But the quickest, the fastest, and hardest, it all depends on what university that VA hospital is associated with. And when I say this, you may have listeners who don't go to a VA hospital. They go to what's called a satellite hospital or, or an annex or a clinic. That clinic is associated with a VA, a main VA hospital. And those, those docs, those psychiatrists and those physicians, odds are, you know, if they're under the age of 40, odds are, or even 50, odds are they, they've been hired directly from that university. If that university happens to be very liberal, very left-wing, odds are that's going to be hit the hardest and quickest. But it's all, it, this is going VAY. This isn't, this isn't something that's going to be limited to one or two states. The ones that resist, I think, are the ones that are, that have the more conservative universities associated with the VA system. But, but, I would advise your listeners to, to do a little bit of homework and, and take a look at, at what, you know, just ask what, what university do the residents come from? What university do the medical students come from? Because there's, there's always, in, in the hospitals, in the main hospitals anyway, there's always going to be a residency program, and they're not VA residents. They're associated with the university, that's associated with that hospital. Those are going to be the ones, the, the people that are that have that that mentality that you know veterans are baby killer mentality. And as they roll out this gun confiscation through the VA, what other institutions, medical institutions, do you think will be next to be um, hit with this type of uh, gun confiscation? Um, Culture? Will it be the private hospitals, or what? What's your thoughts on that? How's the, how's it gonna how's it gonna roll out after after they roll it out to the VA? What's gonna be next? You know, that's that's a very good question. I will say this: I don't know exactly how, but I I, I can tell you where to find out how, and that's through the Affordable Health Care Act. It's it's written in the Affordable Health Care Act. It, it it's crystal clear as to what's going to happen in the Affordable Health Care Act. For example, um, a big thing that, that oddly nobody's, nobody's talking about is there's a, a provision in there, Section 5210 of the Affordable Health Care Act. When I read this, and again, if, if I, would, I would ask your, your listeners to, to ask their physicians if, if they've read the Affordable Health Care Act, because many doctors haven't. You know, and and I understand it's it's long, it's detailed, and there's a lot of gibberish in there. But it, it's going to affect how they practice, and if if they can't keep up with with what's coming down the pike for themselves, how how can they expect them to help you? You know, I've read the Affordable Health Care Act um, with a bunch of colleagues, and we really went through this, and we wanted to figure out what was what and what was coming down the pike for us. And we found Section 5210, and what that says is that the president can basically activate a civilian military because of the Civilian Reserve Officers Corps, and he can activate this during a time of, of national emergencies. But he has to do it through executive order. So even though it's in there, he has to say, okay, by executive order, I, whoever's in office, whether it's Obama or whoever gets in next, they have to activate this. And, and your listeners could go look this up, Section 5210 of the ACA. Well, on the 29th of April, President Obama signed a, a whole bunch of executive orders, making it, you know, National Cesar Chavez Day and this day and, you know, Women's Health Day or something. 
You also find the executive order activating that, that, that civilian reserve corps. And it's a, a military, basically, that doesn't answer to Congress, and that only answers to the president. And it's kind of creepy. It's kind of really creepy when you read it. Because nobody, they're only accountable to the president. They've been activated since the 29th. I haven't, I haven't heard of any of these. I haven't heard the news talk about this, but it's, it's there. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's written on the law. It's, it's written on, on whitehouse.gov. You know, you can, you can go ahead and look at this all you want. So it's not like, it's not like they're not telling us. They're, they're telling us what they're doing. I don't know how, how it's going to go down in the civilian world. I will tell you for a fact that we've been studying you. We know how you're going to act. We know. We've been watching you when, with, with all the, the, the nonsense that's going on on every single TV station, every news station where we're coming for your guns, we're coming for your guns. Do you think for one second that, that, that psychiatrists aren't watching how the, the people who own guns are reacting? Do you think for one second that we don't know that we know two things from, from the last couple of months. We know that there are a lot of people who like to talk, and they say, you can you know, take my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead hands or whatever, and that is talk, because when push comes to shove and they come into the office, we get their guns. So we know at least 98% of the population they're going to give up the guns when the cops come to the house. We know that. We've been, we've been doing this. The other thing we know is, that again, you know, look at it from our perspective. Look at it from, from say, my perspective. We're watching. We know what button to push to get all you people out. We know if we want to get the Patriot moving out, and I say you people because I'm... I'm not a firearm owner, but I don't begrudge them. I'm not a hunter, but I don't begrudge hunters. I see what's coming, and I, I really am afraid of what's coming, but I, I'm not a firearm owner. So when I say you people, I mean it that way. I don't, I don't own guns. You know, I just don't. I've never been around with my, my whole life, and, and it's just not me. But if there's one thing... That, that I can tell you with absolute confidence, I know what button to press with a gun owner. All I have to do is say, somebody's coming for your guns, and they're going to they're gonna show every single weakness that they, they have. I would, I would really, really tell your listeners to, when somebody says, hey, you know, we're coming for your guns, to not really get upset in public about it, because you never know who's watching. Because people like me are watching. We're watching you in the waiting room of the hospitals. We're watching, we're watching you in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? We know how you're reacting. We know by somebody's reaction when they go overboard, if, if there's a crowd of people and I say, I'm going to take your guns, the people who are freaking out, they're the ones who own guns. The people who are just sitting there calmly, Probably the more firearm. Could you talk about what happens to uh, the children and the pets if uh, you go after their guns and uh, uh, commit them to a, a psych ward? Pets don't get fed, and children go to child protective services. What happens to the uh, pets again? They don't get fed. Okay. And uh, don't you think that's a detriment on the children when you? Um, when you uh, put these veterans in, in psych wards for days, don't you think that's a little bit, uh, uh, isn't there a moral issue with, you know, having the children being put in, you know, social foster care when they didn't really need to be? Absolutely. On, on my case and, and other people, that's why we're coming out about this. But as far as, as far as, you know, if, if somebody's a danger to society or a possible danger to society, then they're a possible danger to the kids. This gun grab, right, sir, is not, it's not going to stop with guns. 
it is this is just this is just part one. They're gonna come after your kids next. And if you think that's a long shot, listen to what was just said on MSNBC. It's the biggest problem that I have with this whole gun grab thing, and again, I'm not a gun owner. The biggest problem I have is where does it end? If they come for the guns and they get them and they win, what's next? Nothing is safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Of course. Me personally, I think it's horrible that children are taking them to this protective service. CPS and Child Protective Services. But to a lot of people, to, to all my coworkers, it's better that they're in with Child Protective Service than it's not with the gun. I got you. Could you comment on the mass shootings and how that may be playing into the ramp up of uh, the gun grab, or is it uh, the other way around? Or, or and could you comment on psychotropic medications, their prevalent use in America, and how that maybe plays into everything? Or is there some sort of connection? Now, I don't know. I don't know any patient history personally, but I will say this: psychotropic medication. I mean. <laughs> Let's take a look at, at Adam Lanza, for example, okay? And I know it's, you know, horrible and, and everything that went on, and, and, but, but let's look at, at this guy. Look at his pictures when he was a kid. And as a kid, he's, he's smiling. He looks normal. He looks like a normal, happy kid. And then later in life, as a teen, he looks crazy. He has a, he has a, he has a, a look on him, right? Where every, you can see it. His eyes are all bugged out and... He has, he has a psychotic look to him. There's no question in my mind that he was on a, a plethora of medications. No question whatsoever. Um, do I believe psychotropic medicines are a good thing? Not for everybody. I think they're good for a, a very small, small percentage of people. But I think... The way we hand out psychotropic medications, including sleep medications, is just, it is the cause, not the effect of these shootings. There is no question. I mean, I'm sure that there are a lot of other things that go along with it, but when, when I medicate a patient to the point where they're not feeling anything, and I'm in, in, in a, a, an area with them, I'm in a room with them where... You know, I can tell that I can really, you know, up their, their meds or, or lower their meds or change their meds. I'll try to change their medications. The problem is, is that I just can't take somebody off a psych psychotropic medication, even an antidepressant. Anybody who's on an antidepressant now, if you want to get off of it, you, if you just quit cold turkey, you're running the risk of, of a lot of problems, including seizures and death. And it's, it's very real. So we can't, you got to lower one medication while bringing up another medication. One of the things I try to tell patients, and I, I really try, I don't say you don't need the pill, but I do say this. I say, because in the VA, if, if you don't prescribe, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're really not going to get the patient to come back and, you know, their VA isn't going to get their funds and it's all about money, right? But what I usually tell patients is any medication that I give you is going to change your brain chemistry. If you want that check, that disability check, and you don't care about your brain chemistry being changed because even an antidepressant changes brain chemistry, and that's up to you. And you keep telling me that the symptoms that you're having, you're having. But if you really aren't having these symptoms, and you can really do without these checks, because I don't, I don't know if the patient goes home and is really depressed and is crying. I can only, I can only go by what they're telling me. If you think that you really don't need this pill, and you really don't want your brain chemistry changed, and, and you could go out and, 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 and deal with the, the, the not getting a disability check, then that's up to you. But I'm changing your brain chemistry. A psychiatrist is changing your brain chemistry, like it or not. That's, that's, 
that's what we that's what we do. That's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, right? You know, so a lot of people don't really know what's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. We get to prescribe drugs. We change brain chemistry. We don't want to talk to you. That's why. That's why most psychiatrists, you know, you see them for an hour the first time, and then after that, ten minutes. How are you doing? Any side effects? Everything's good. See you later. If you want to talk to somebody, we have plenty of psychologists to do that. We don't talk. We change brain chemistry. I truly believe that the amount of people that we are going to have another mass shooting, it's going to happen. And I think that that whoever's, whatever the narrative is, that's what's, that's going to be the policy. As they say in this administration, never let a crisis go to waste, right? The Colorado shooting, I mean, crystal clear, that guy, I mean, look at him when he was on trial. I don't know anything about before his trial, but he was on something. Um, it looked like they, they, they B-52'd him, which, you know, if somebody's hostile in, in the psychiatric ward or even in the ER, we, we do what's called the B-52. It's Haldol, Benadryl, and Ativan, and it, it knocks you down because um, he just was rolling his eyes and looked out of it. Um, this Adam Lanza kid, you know, I mean, just look at him. You know, he's, he's, he's on medication. There's, there's no question he was on medication. It's just what was he on? What was the combination thereof? And this brings me to another important point that I really want all veterans to, to understand. There is no doubt, how the hell I put this? I'm saying this as a psychiatrist in the VA, okay? I find it quite odd that there are more suicides per day than there are deaths in the battlefield. We lose 26 veterans on average per day to suicide. That comes to almost 10,000 per year that we lose to suicide every day. There's no question in my mind that that doesn't have to do with the medications, the sub subjectability that the, the patient's under to, to a, a psychiatrist that doesn't like you, um, there are psychiatrists that, that see you as the enemy. You know, there are psychiatrists, you know, that you killed their Muslim brothers. You killed another Muslim. You deserve to die. It's a fact. Just because somebody has MD or DR in their name, don't assume that they took the Hippocratic Oath to help you. They may have taken the Hippocratic Oath to help themselves and to help their people. 26, 26 veterans a day, that's disgusting. That is uncalled for. But we accept it. And, uh, Doctor, this is my last question. Um, if, um, if this gets rolled out successfully through the Veterans Administration, active duty, and it goes to the private hospitals, how do you think they're going to address the uninsured Americans? There's quite a few of them. Do you think... Uh, how would they go about uh, getting their guns? That's an excellent question. Nobody, the Affordable Health Care Act is not about everybody having health care. Understand that. And, and, and to your listeners, please understand what, this, what the Affordable Health Care Act is about. The Affordable Health Care Act is about everybody being insured, everybody having medical insurance, for, for everybody to be insured despite any kind of pre-existing condition. If you can't get it through the private insurance company, if you can't afford it, or if you have a pre-existing condition that the private insurance companies, for as long as they last, which isn't going to be long, then you'll be on Obamacare, and that's what Obamacare is about. Obamacare isn't about free health care for all. It's about getting everybody insured. And that, that's where things were lost in translation in the whole debate. It had nothing to do with everybody getting free health. Everybody in America, in this country, 
let's leave one one reality is if you're sick and you call 911, you're going to a hospital, you're going to be stabilized. You're going to be transferred to another hospital. Nobody's going to let you out to die. We're not, we're not letting, people aren't dying in the streets despite what politicians like to say. They're not, unless they're homeless and they're dying in the street because, you know, they're on drugs or whatever. But people aren't dying of, in the streets. It's, it's not happening. You know, hospitals, hospitals get away with charity. You know, they, they, they want people to, to come in that don't have health insurance because they get to rate that off as a, as a, a, a charitable, you know, deduction. Obamacare is about getting everybody insured. So when everybody's insured, you're not going to really have a choice. And the other thing that's going to happen by 2016 is, is this electronic health care record. That, that it's been sold as, you know, your doctor can, can be over in England and, and he can prescribe your medication or she can look at your EKG from, you know, from Timbuktu or whatever. It's not what it's about. That, that, that's possible, absolutely. But it's not what it's about. It's about information control. It's about what, you know, just the more information is in a database, like Google is a big example. You know, I, I one of the things that somebody said just very, very recently was something about Google. You think for one thing that Google isn't going to stick in their hand in that pot, you're out of your mind. You know, anything that's on computer, I mean, this is, if you say that you have a firearm, if you said that, mentioned that two years ago to a doctor, odds are that's in your medical record. That's going to get transferred. That's going to be carried over. Everything that you say to a physician, a nurse, a tech, anybody in a hospital, it's, it's, if it isn't in your record, it's going to be in your record. And your health record is going to be what follows you around. Your health record, it's not about, like, like we know this because we get taught this. We go to meetings about this. Your health record is going to be what, what determines what you are, who you are, where you are in society. That's what Obamacare is about. That, that's what the Affordable Health Care Act is about. As long as it is, try to read it. If, if you really want to be, you can do two things with, with the Affordable Health Care Act. It'll put you to sleep, and it'll scare the hell out of you. Well, Doctor, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your knowledge. Uh, perhaps we'll visit with you again to explore this further. But right now, I think the answers I got were that uh, it's not about when gun, gun confiscation is going to happen. It sounds like it is happening, especially through the VA seems to be that's going to be the big push, and then it'll jump off to the private sector from there. Any last points before we go here? I appreciate you, you taking the time to listen and get the message out. As I said, I've been, I've been trying to do this for quite some time, and, and it's just, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to go to different outlets, and, you know, it, it, it started with this Navy veteran. You know, I, I can only say that... Um, the last thing I'd really like to tell us that's number one is thank you for your service. That people like them, I recognize that people like them are what is giving me my freedom and my job to come here and say this and to try to help them. And there are physicians in the VA system, there are people that, that do that do care about you, that, that do not want to see you get hurt. You know, we know you you protected us and, and took an oath to protect us whether you were out in the battlefield or not. We, we know that. And hopefully this will initiate other physicians to come out and, and say what they know because, you know, we owe this to our veterans. And, and again, this is, this is going to come, this is, this is much bigger than, and just me saying this, this is, this is bigger than all of us right now, and, and it is happening. The gun grab is happening. It's going to be slow. It's going to be gradual. Everybody knows that that's the best way. We've studied this. This is the best way to do this. And again, if, if you ever need to have any other questions or anything, please feel free. You know, I'll, I'll be more than happy to help you out.